Revelation chapters 2 and 3 deal with seven churches, seven letters that were directly dictated to John by Jesus Christ himself. And these seven letters are to seven chosen churches. And they're called the seven churches of Asia. And I brought up the question, why did, why did Jesus choose these seven churches? There were hundreds of churches existing in that time. There were more than seven. So why did he pick these seven? And why are they in the order that they're in? Well, I brought out last time, it took students of prophecy a long time to look back over church history to see that these churches were chosen and put in the order they're in because the characteristics of each one of these churches are can be seen as the dominant characteristics of the stages of church history. Now, they were seven literal churches, and so the message to each one of these churches was actually real and to a real church. So we can get benefit personally and as individual churches from studying what their problems were, what Jesus said the answer was, and so forth. And so they have application to that, but they also have a prophetic application. And so as we go through, I want to point out each, what each stage of history these churches indicate. Now, there's a divine format that's used for each one of these uh, letters from Jesus to these churches. First, there is the addressee. And we read, for instance, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, right? And I, I brought out the, the fact that in the Greek, the word angelos can either mean an angel in the traditional sense, or it can mean what the Greek word basically means, which is messenger. And in this case, each time it should be to the messenger of the church of Ephesus, right? And this is really writing to the one who would be the preacher of that church or the, the leadership of that church. And we find here in the church of Ephesus, Let's read. It says, The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this. Each one of these letters gives a description of certain attributes of Jesus. And you'll find that each, each time these attributes are used in the introduction, it applies to the answer the church needs or it applies to a message that they need from him that is a warning. So when he says to the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the seven stars in Revelation chapter 1, uh, verse 20 and 21, are, are the messengers of the church. So he says, he holds the leader of these churches in his right hand. He reminds him of it. And it says he walks among the seven lampstands. And it's explained that this is a symbol of the church. So it shows that he is intimately circulating constantly among the local churches. That's why we don't need a hierarchy. Jesus himself is supposed to be the leader, not some man-made hierarchy. Church has gotten in trouble every time that's happened. Because then all Satan has to do is wipe out, the, you know, subject the hierarchy, trick them, and then they've got control of the whole church. So anyway, he talks about this and he says, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance that you cannot endure evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. After the address, he gives a commendation to each one. Except he doesn't give a commendation to Thyatira, which is an apostate church. So he compliments them. He says, and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. So there is the commendation. Now comes the rebuke. But I have this against you, 
that you have left your first love. Now, you see, he shows that they, doctrinally, they are wonderful. Doctrinally, this church is it's dealing with false teachers. It's dealing with falsehoods. They persevered by faith under fire when, when persecuted and so forth. But he says, you know, all of these things are wonderful, but in the process, you lost your first love. There is nothing more important in the Christian life than to keep a fervent, focused love on Jesus Christ. That's more important than all the work you can ever do, all you can ever learn, or anything else. Because if you lose that, you lose your compass. And so I've had to look at and remember this. You know, I'd be in the midst of soul winning crusades and all of that and you get all excited and I, I can remember studying and studying and learning and getting all excited about learning the word of God. All that's good. But if you let your love for Jesus slip, then you've lost something that is central to everything. And that's what he wants from every one of us as a Christian. He said, well, you know, how do you work up love? You know what I find rekindles the love in my heart for Jesus? First of all is to realize that I've let things kind of crowd it out. I've gotten careless. That's important. But what's really important is brought out in 1 John. Hold your place here. In 1 John, just a couple of little letters back. 1 John chapter 4. And we're going to go back and forth to 1 John, so hold your place there. It's only a few pages back from the book of Revelation. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that he might live through him. And in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins or to be the satisfaction for our sins. In other words, we have to realize that, you know, we never loved God first. He first loved us. And to refocus on everything, that when we were enemies, he was willing to take every sin we'd ever commit and die horrible death in our place to pay for it. And the more you know about what God has done for you by grace, the more your heart responds to that with love. You see, we can't love God. We can't initiate love for God. We can only love him back. And so, you know, someone asked me, what's the definition of worship? Well, it isn't people singing over and over hymns and especially modern hymns where they're kind of almost like a mantra they keep repeating the same things and so forth forgive me musical department but I don't mean that as an insult but that is not necessarily worship worship in its simplest definition is loving God back okay we need to keep our focus on Jesus Christ. How many times a day do you think about Jesus? You know, that's a good test. When you lose your first love, it's because you get, Jesus gets crowded out in well-meaning things, and it happens so easily, so inadvertently. But he wants us to meditate upon him, to think about him, to be occupied with him. And whatever you're doing, bring him into it. Sometimes it's hard. It's embarrassing. Okay, yeah, 
you're there, Lord, and look what I'm doing. But it sure straightens things out fast. But God wants us, above all, to keep our first love. I can remember when I first became a Christian and, and I began to learn about what God had done for me and how he delivered me from just all kinds of internal conflicts and things like that. And then for the first time in years and years, I had peace. I, I just couldn't stop thinking about Jesus. I mean, I just loved him so much. Sometimes I'd be overwhelmed when I was sitting at work trying to, I was a draftsman at that moment, and I was trying to draft things, and tears would be running down my face. And it was just because I'd be so overwhelmed with the fact that he loved me enough to do this with when I was absolutely his enemy. Well, you know, I I could stay weeks on chapters two and three, but I don't think I don't think you came to hear me preach about that. Most of you here because you want prophecy. Okay, let's go back. Chapter two. So he says Verse 5, remember therefore from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Nicolaitans is a word that is composed of two Greek words, nikos, which means victory over, victory. Nikao means to be a victor. And le, uh, laity, which means people. And this means to be, you hate those that see themselves as victors over the people. Priestcraft. In other words, they hated, he said, you hate those that try to set themselves up as lords over you. And so forth. He wants us to be answerable directly to him and to realize it is to him we're answerable. And it is to him that we owe all allegiance. He says, I'm glad you hate him. Now, he says, now in verse 7, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 